You know, for the most part, as humans and as a society, we love things like, like birthday parties and weddings and graduations. We, we love to celebrate. We love to party. We love to laugh. We love things like balloons and food and cake and dancing. And usually accompanying this fascination with party comes joy and laughter, happiness and enjoyment. And obviously, these are all things that for the most part, unless you're an absolute Grinch, we as a people love to feel and we love to experience. And this is evidenced by what we give our money to. You know, for example, last year as Americans, we spent $936 billion on Christmas. We spent over $12 billion on Halloween this year. And how about the holiday of love? How much do we love celebrating love, romance, and chocolate? About $26 billion. As a people, we love celebrations, we love parties, we love happiness. But here's a hard truth for us to swallow. Life is not all roses. Life is not an ongoing or never-ending party. Sometimes life sucks. In fact, something we all have to navigate at some point or another, whether you like to admit it or not, whether you like to think about it or not, is death, and sadness, grief, and loss. It's a part of life. It's a part of what it means to be human. In fact, among the first things that we experience as humans when we're born into this world are tears. And from that moment on, we're exposed to a harsh reality. One that involves pain and suffering, grief and loss, it's unavoidable. And this is a reality that Jesus even confirmed for us on one occasion when he was speaking with his disciples when he said this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. As we journey towards an emotionally healthy spirituality, we have to discuss this reality. Wrapped up into our grief and loss is a slew of emotions. If we're unable to cope with our emotions properly, it can lead to an unhealthy experience that can impact not only our lives, but even those around us. When's the last time you experienced loss? When's the last time you grieved? We all go through it. We all experience loss. Maybe you lost a loved one. You lost a career, lost a relationship, or lost an opportunity. How did you feel? How did you process your emotions? Who did you seek help or comfort from? And how did your theology hold up during that season of grief or loss? Now, honestly, perhaps many of us have never even had this discussion. We've never even brought up these questions, either because we thought we were strong enough to deal with it on our own, or we simply were too broken and they didn't want to be seen as weak. So today, as we begin this topic, as we talk about this topic, we begin with this idea, and that is number one in your notes, that we grieve. If you have a pulse today, guess what? You will experience grief. You will experience loss. It's a matter of time. It appears to me that the older we get, the more opportunities we have to experience grief and loss. So if you're young and you haven't experienced much of this, just wait, because we all experience grief. So what we want to do is give space to experience grief. Acknowledge that this is a fact of life. In fact, uh, we, we, read this past, we read this passage last week, but it bears mentioning, again, Jesus also experienced grief. And on one occasion, when he learned about the passing of a good friend of his, he went to meet up with the family and he saw their profound pain and he could no longer hold back the grief built up in his heart and this is where we read the shortest verse in the whole Bible, John chapter 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. Because we all grieve. You're not a weirdo. You're not a hassle. You're not a nuisance. This is an emotion and a feeling that unfortunately, this side of heaven, we all have to experience and we all have experience and will experience. In fact, you know, while I was preparing this message, this question popped into my own head. Was there grief and sorrow before the fall of man, before sin. And the best I can tell, it seems like grief, sorrow, and sadness are consequences of sin. And nevertheless, this is a reality that we all experience. So we begin here. You can grieve. This is an incredibly human experience that we all share. And since that's true, we give space to grieve loss. Sometimes we grieve, sometimes what we grieve is the physical passing of a loved one. But not all loss is necessarily connected to death. We grieve other losses as well, relational losses. Maybe there was someone that seemed to be your soulmate, but it didn't work out at the end. Professional losses. You were laid off from work or you weren't the right fit for the job or you just don't seem to fit into the culture of the workplace. 
Friendship loss, right? Someone who was a best friend and moved on or moved away. Transitional loss, a change of pace or place, and now you're grieving all the unfamiliar things you have to learn in this new environment, and the, and the list is endless. Nevertheless, we begin with this fact, and that is that we grieve. Secondly, I want to encourage us towards this, and that is number two in your notes, that we grieve honestly. And what do I mean by this? Well, that we don't need to sugarcoat our grieving. We don't need to pretend that everything is okay when it's not. We don't need to put on a facade and try to convince everyone else, or honestly, who we're usually trying to convince is us, that everything is fine and dandy, when instead we're genuinely grieving on the inside. No, we can grieve honestly. Now, I love how God's Word gives us a snapshot into real human life and emotions and grief, because that's what life is actually like. And for example, when you read the Psalms, you're able to see how raw the psalmist is. I mean, he's almost schizophrenic in his writing because that's what the human experience sometimes feels like. In the same chapter, there's doubts, and then there's outright questioning of God, and then there's an expression of fear, and then there's an overwhelming sense of confidence that God will get them through. You know, I love what the psalmist writes in Psalms chapter 42. Check out his honesty. My tears have been my food day and night. While all day long, people say to me, where is your God? Have you been there before? Where your tears are your food because you're in a season of grief? Where your hurt is so strong that no matter what you do, you simply cannot uh, keep your composure? Well, then you're in good company with many people in the Bible. In that same chapter, the author goes on to say this, Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will praise Him, my Savior and my God. And in that same breath, he says, I am deeply depressed. It almost feels like the psalmist is speaking from both sides of his mouth. On one hand, his soul is in pain. On the other hand, he's attempting to encourage his soul to find hope in God. But then in the same breath, an admission of how he is feeling at that moment, I am depressed. So here's your call to grieve honestly. Forget the churchy responses. No, we're not always in victory. We're not always in glory. When you're not okay, admit it. For some of you, you haven't been able to even begin the road to healing because you've been unwilling to admit that you're hurting. But on this journey to emotionally healthy spirituality, as we're encouraged to grow emotionally mature as followers of Christ, we have permission to grieve honestly. This means you admit your grief and you honestly express what you're experiencing. Which leads me to another question. Who do you grieve to? Who do you share this information with? Well, number three in your notes, you can write this down. We grieve in solitude and with others. In the Bible, it appears that we see both of these sides represented. In other words, it's not just always sharing everything with everyone. It's not always locking yourself in the bathroom to let out a good cry. It seems like in, in the Bible, we see a need for both. Both grieving in solitude and also expressing that grief to others are healthy and necessary. In fact, when Jesus was going through one of the most painstakingly emotional and spiritually challenging moments of his life, perhaps just hours before he would be put on trial and ultimately murdered, we read about him retreating to pray. And we know he's under extreme duress, he's, he's, he's stressed, he's anxious, he's experiencing fear. But what he does is decide to bring all these things, the source of his grief, to God the Father in prayer. But what's interesting is that he does a combo of grieving and solitude, but also with the community of friends that he's built with the disciples. He climbs the Mount of Olives and he enters the Garden of Gethsemane with the disciples. But then he dismisses them and he retreats just a little further to bring this grief to God in prayer. Let's look at Luke chapter 22. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and began to pray. Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your wills be done. Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood, falling to the ground, when he got up from prayer and came to the disciples, he found them sleeping and exhausted from their grief. In one sense, Jesus is alone with God expressing this grief to him 
And we know just how severe an emotional battle this is because the author, Luke, who is a medical doctor, tells us that he's sweating drops of blood. He's expressing his anguish to God the Father. But there with him, and in some way grieving with him, are his disciples. And he's asking them to pray with him, to keep watch with him. It is incredibly healthy to grieve in solitude. We certainly need that. But it is also equally important that we grieve together. And the resource that God has given us, implemented and planted by Jesus himself, is the local church. The church is a family. And as a family, it should be a safe place to grieve and express your emotions. Maybe not every single person needs to know, but there should be a trusted few where you can share your grief. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, encourages us with this. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Have you shared your grief and loss with those in your church family? Have you tapped into the resource given and gifted by God Himself, the local church? And here's a question for all of us to wrestle with. Swerve, listen to me. Are we becoming a church family that is a safe place for people to open up and share some of the most vulnerable moments? A place where people can express their grief and find healing from a family that is willing to listen, that is willing to pray, that is willing to grieve alongside and willing to encourage. Are we as a church being that? Because if not, whose fault is that? Is that one person's fault? The church isn't a person or a personality. The church is all of us, the collective, which means we all hold the responsibility to help each other to grieve within a loving community. And here's the last thought for today. Number four, we grieve with hope. As a pastor and throughout my experience in ministry, and just as a follower of Christ for most of my life, I've been able to partake in many funerals. And I got to say, there's a different feeling in the atmosphere and the environment when I attend a believer's funeral versus a non-believer. There's many similarities. For example, there will always be tears. There will always be flowers. There will always be pictures and a slideshow and kind words and memories shared. However, there's a tangible difference between the grieving of a follower of Christ versus someone who isn't. Why is that? It's because there is an immense amount of hope in the heart of a follower of Christ. And I know that this conversation of grief isn't only connected to the passing of a loved one, but it is impossible to not mention this most prevalent example. There is a certainty within the heart of a follower of Christ. For those who have surrendered to Jesus, we know that God's word teaches that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And of course, there are tears. There's hurt and sincere pain in the heart of the loved ones, but yet it is matched and sometimes even overwhelmed by hope. This is the hope that we can have as followers of Christ, even in moments of seasons or seasons of grief and loss. It's that hope that can help us overcome the grief. It's that hope that gives us the strength to stand strong, to press in and to not give up. It's that hope that allows us to see the light at the end of the tunnel, no matter how dire the situation. Why do we have hope? It's one reason, and one reason only. It's because of Jesus. It's the hope that we have in the gospel. The greatest grief that you and I have is the grief that we've caused to the heart of God because of our sin, which broke our relationship to the creator of the universe. An offense so great that it merits God righteous judgment and wrath. But God is an immense love for us, sent Jesus in our place to live the perfect and sinless life that we're incapable of living and the sinless life that we're incapable of living to uphold God's righteous and moral law. He was sent on a mission to redeem mankind as the ultimate expression of God's love for you and me. Jesus was known as the suffering servant, a man of sorrows. Though he was innocent and preached a message of peace in the coming kingdom of God, he was rejected and despised and ultimately sentenced to death, the death penalty by way of Roman crucifixion. And on that cross, his heart full of grief and a life of suffering, he died. His death was in our place as the satisfaction of God's wrath for our sin, his blood able to purify us from all unrighteousness. 
the disciples and Mary grieved as they placed Jesus' body in the tomb, thinking that all hope was lost. That is until a hope arise. On the third day, Jesus crushed the head of the serpent, conquering Satan, sin, and death. And now all who put their faith in the finished work of Jesus, we have a new life, forgiveness of sin, and an eternity secured. And if you're here today and you've yet to put your faith in Jesus, here is your call. Here is your opportunity. Simply place your faith and trust in Jesus. Then you can go from death to life, from hopeless to hopeful because of Jesus. And this doesn't mean that you will have a life free from grief, free from pain or suffering. Jesus told us, you will have suffering. We will grieve. We will hurt. But because of Jesus, who also suffered with us, our suffering isn't without hope. That hope is grounded in the fact that God will one day restore all things. Before the fall, there was no grieving. And this is the promise that we have in Scripture, Revelation 21.4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. I don't know about you guys, but I long for a day. I long for that day. As the news is inundated with images of people grieving and suffering with war and murder and sickness and greed, we know that one day those things will be no more and this fills us with hope. In the meantime, we grieve. It's a part of our human nature. So we will grieve honestly. No need to fake it till we make it. We're going to grieve in solitude, spending time alone with God in prayer. But we're also going to grieve as a family. And I look for a family that can help us grieve and process and encourage us in the process. And we grieve with hope, knowing that one day Jesus will wipe away every tear. And we'll be in the presence of God, fully known, fully restored, and fully made new. Lord, I pray that you would help us to grieve honestly, that we may admit our feelings and admit our need for help. I pray that we might be a community of believers that would rejoice with those who rejoice and grieve with those who grieve, that we might be a supportive, Christ-centered community, helping to bring comfort to those who need it. I pray for those who are grieving a loss right now, whether that is of a loved one, a relationship, a job, or something else. Would you comfort them? Would you give them strength? Bring to memory your word and help them through this season. And for all of us, I pray, God, that we might grieve with hope, knowing that while we might face hardships on this side of eternity, Jesus, you have conquered the world. And we long for the day where our tears will be no more and we will be in the presence of God forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.